Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for session two of Remote Sensing for Freshwater Habitats. Um, my name is Amber McCullum, and um, last week you heard from my colleague Juan Torres Perez, um, and um, I will be the lead for this session. Just a few reminders before we get started. Um, for this training, we have three one-hour sessions. Um, last week on September 17th, this week um, September 24th, and then our final session will be on October 1st. We are presenting the same content in two different live sessions, and note that you only need to attend one of these sessions per week. Um, you can find all the course materials on the website listed here. And after each session, um, along with today's session, we will have a question and answer portion. Um, you can type your questions in along the way in the Q&A box, and uh, we'll be keeping track of those and going through those at the end of today's session. Um, but if we don't get to any of your questions or you have questions, feel free to email myself or um, Juan at our email addresses listed here. As with most of our RSET trainings, we will have a homework assignment, and this homework assignment will provide you with the link to that next week, and um, it will be via Google Forms. And in order to obtain a certificate of completion, you must um, attend all the, of the live webinars and complete the homework assignment um, by Tuesday, October 15th. So that gives you two weeks after we provide you with the link to the homework to complete that. And um, if you meet these requirements, you'll receive your certificate of completion about two months after um, the course has ended. The only prerequisite for this course is to have um, completed our Fundamentals of Remote Sensing um, course or have equivalent knowledge. Um, and again, just a reminder, if you don't have at least some introduction uh, or background to remote sensing, you might follow behind a little in these sessions. Um, this is still a um, fairly introductory webinar, but it's great to have that background. Um, and then again, all the course materials here um, at the course uh, website listed here. And this includes the um, presentation materials in both English and Spanish. Um, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and then um, we will also post the answers to the question and answer session um, at some point on the website there for reference as well. So um, this is the course outline. Um, last week you um, heard about aquatic remote sensing, and then this week we are going to really focus on um, landscape genetics and the riverscape analysis project. And then next week we will follow on with the freshwater health index. So before we get started with um, today's materials, I just wanted to provide a brief review of last session. So we discussed the importance of inland water bodies and how management decisions can be made through earth observations. And there are many freshwater parameters you can monitor via remote sensing, such as depth, uh, suspended sediments, uh, surface water extent, um, and looking at water quality parameters like chlorophyll A and river complexity, and much more. Uh, Juan also provided a few case study examples, such as the use of NASA data to track algal blooms in Lake Erie or mapping bathymetry of rivers in Yellowstone National Park. So we're going to follow on with that um, for today with uh, a review of landscape genetics and the ties of this sort of new study area to remote sensing data. And then we'll discuss some examples of um, landscape genetic uh, projects and research. And then we will discuss the Riverscape Analysis Project and um, provide a, a short demonstration of the tool and then conclude with a question and answer session. OK, so first let's jump into um, landscape genetics. 
Landscape genetics is the study of the influence of the landscape or environmental features on the genetic diversity of populations. This is a really new field and it really centers around the environmental features and species and therefore remote sensing Geospatial statistics are really integral to conducting these studies. Landscape genetics combines landscape with genetic monitoring. This allows us to monitor things like the probability of tiger movement on a landscape, like in this example um, on the right. It's really a vital tool for monitoring endangered and threatened species and while it can be applied to a variety of different landscapes, we're going to um, really then bring it back to freshwater systems. So we'll, we'll sort of talk about it broadly and um, it, you'll see applicability to different ecosystems, but then we'll, we'll connect it back to the freshwater systems where landscape genetics is really commonly used. Landscape ecology. One piece of landscape genetics research is the study of the pattern and the interaction between ecosystems within the region of interest and how these interactions affect the ecological process. For many years, remote sensing has been a vital component of landscape ecology to identify and monitor things like land cover classification for establishing specific habitat types, um, for change detection, to understand connectivity and fragmentation of ecosystems, and these are things like corridor mapping and patch identification. And um, remote sensing has also been used for climate change assessment. The other piece of landscape ecology is genetic monitoring, which is the study of the structure and function of chromosomes and gene expression. These genetic markers can be used to identify individuals, species, or populations. And especially to quantify changes in population genetic metrics. So these are things like effective population size or genetic diversity. And really establishing these changes over time. And Genetic monitoring is thus use useful for detecting changes in species abundance or diversity. And this is a really important tool for conservation management, especially in highly controlled river systems where the health of certain fish species is managed. A really common type of genetic monitoring is the use of eDNA or environmental DNA. This is where the genetic material is obtained from environmental samples without connect collecting the DNA directly from a species. So this could be collecting samples from soil, rocks, or through the water column. In freshwater and marine ecosystems, this is particularly useful as these samples provide a here and now snapshot of the species that have been in these systems and can provide a relative abundance of fish species, and especially for fish that are um, vulnerable or evasive, hard to um, catch. eDNA monitoring has two strong advantages over conventional techniques. Um, the increased sensitivity, so uh, the ability to monitor these elusive species, and reduce cost. Um, DNA-based detection tends to outperform other common biological survey techniques in terms of the number of species detected and can really do so in a non-invasive way. This schematic provides a bit more detail about how eDNA sampling works for a water sample. First, the water sample is collected and geolocated. Next, DNA is extracted and amplified using a method called PCR. The amplified DNA is then purified and undergoes next generation sequencing. 
during which the section of a gene is known as the barcode gene is sequenced and provides researchers with thousands of sequences at the same time. Subsequently, following complex bioinformatic analysis, the sequences are assigned to an operational taxonomic unit. So this is a group of closely related individuals. These are then compared against an existing database of taxonomic units to identify which species um, are within the eDNA sample. So I do want to point out that this is not a perfect approach and eDNA sampling has its own limitations. Um, and this, this portion of um, this research can be a high cost um, in order to, to run the um, lab sampling. And there's also the possibility that it may be difficult to um, establish differences in related species. Uh, but it's really a useful marker to compare to landscape information. Okay, so now that we've discussed what landscape genetics is, we're going to go through um, some of the various steps involved in performing this type of analyses. Um, and I also want to mention that much of this subsequent information was provided from the RAP website. So for further questions, I do really want to um, direct you to that website about the specifics of how these studies are conducted. Um, but it would be great uh, to get a sense of how many of you have conducted landscape genetics analyses. So if you could, um, in your window, just raise your hand if you've ever conducted um, any type of landscape genetic analyses. All landscape and riverscape genetics analyses are different, and they may include or exclude some of these steps, but in general, this is an outline of the process. First, um, data acquisition, so the collection of those eDNA or DNA samples. Second, analyzing the landscape variables and creating resistance map layers, which we'll discuss um, soon. Then conducting modeling, um, and also uh, running geospatial statistics. And we'll not really get into those specific pieces in a lot of detail today, but again, um, I have some resources for you to follow up with questions on those. And then really, um, a lot of these research studies um, end with conducting vulnerability analysis for a specific species. And, um, assessing the vulnerability of those species with the potential for climate change. Um, so that involves running multiple scenarios under different parameters for whatever species you're interested in. So the data acquisition portion um, involves collecting both the in situ data as well as landscape data. And the landscape data can be um, things like elevation, um, water quality parameters, habitat type, and many others. These, the types of data that you would want to collect will really vary based on your understanding of the species or the multiple species of interest. Um, in session one, we covered some of these remote sensing products that can be used in assessing habitat conditions, such as those like um, understanding a, a digital elevation model. And then, as I mentioned previously, the in-situ um, data acquisition can be the eDNA or the DNA samples. This portion will then be followed by the genetic analyses of the in-situ sam samples. And many of these projects all often have a citizen science component as well, and we'll talk about um, how that works with the, the RAP example. Common methodology used for understanding how landscapes or riverscapes influence gene flow 
in a species really relies heavily on these weighted individual landscape features. So these features can be things like the elevation or the habitat type, location of the river, width of the river, um, and these are combined into resistance maps. A resistant surface becomes a hypothesis for movement or gene flow that allows for the identification of areas or barriers that um, impede or enhance this gene flow. So in this example, um, in this image shown here on the right, is the Flathead River drainage in Montana. And the dots depict the barriers to the movement of fish species. So these are um, things like culverts and dams that will therefore inhibit gene flow within fish species of these rivers. The relative strength of the barrier or any landscape variable um, may be subjective. And it, this might rely on the individual research researcher's ability to identify the strength of the barrier. So for each resistance layer, weights are assigned to um, each habitat um, type here. So for example, um, in the case of dams, that might be a much more clear barrier. Um, and so the uh, resistance is higher. Whereas a temperature gradient might be um, less understood um, in its effect on the gene flow. So um, those two different types of barriers might be assigned different weights. So this slide depicts how those weights might be assigned by the researcher to identify um, how each variable affects movement, survival, abundance, or reproduction of a species. Each pixel in a remotely sensed image, for example, is assigned a weight based on the properties of that variable. These weights can then be adjusted according to the user's understanding of the ecosystem. In this example, you can see an image on the left with snow cover shown in white. For this resistance map layer, the particular species prefer to travel over snow than bare landscape. Thus, the pixels with snow are assigned a low number indicating low resistance or that it's easier for that species to follow along this path. So the same thing can be applied to um, these barriers in riverscapes. Within these steps, there may be a lot of questions or uncertainties with the assignment of the weights. And this can be a somewhat subjective process that can be modeled and tested with effectiveness by using um, in situ data. These parameters can be modified as the researcher moves through the process. So these questions may be things like, where will the individuals move to and from? What in the environment might enhance or limit this movement? How might this affect variations in future individuals or populations? And what are the pathways and barriers in freshwater systems, such as dams, changes in water quality parameters, stream flow directions, or changes to stream size? Once the resistance snap layers are created, a hypothetical resistance surface must be run through a connectivity model to calculate essentially how the individual will move through the system. And there are two models um, generally used in these types of studies, the least cost path and the circuit theory. And so we're not going to go into these in, in any depth for this webinar series, but I do encourage you to um, check out the RAP website for more information on what these two types of models are. To find the best fitting um, surface layer that explains the genetic structure based on these landscape features and the in-situ data, um, this will require running many models and also um, really running a lot of statistical analyses. So um, some of common approaches uh, to these statistical models are shown here. 
um, such as regression analysis or spatial audit correlation. And I would encourage you to refer to the um, paper listed here um, for a whole suite of information. It's, it's sort of a review paper of these common approaches to understanding genetic patterns. So through conducting all of the steps of landscape genetics analysis, running the statistical models, connecting landscape features to species movement and change, this, is a, this can be really powerful when assessing the vulnerability of specific species or identifying um, the degree of the future risk of a species to changes in climate. And can be really used for mitigation planning, uh, management activities, and identifying how minor shifts like things of temperature and altered stream flow might dramatically affect freshwater systems. And in particular, species in terms of diversity and abundance. So before we went through some of these steps, we asked you all to raise your hand if you've ever conducted genetic um, landscape analyses, but um, if you have done that and you've also conducted vulnerability assessment on specific species, it would be great if to hear from you all about um, what species you are interested in and and the region of interest for the species that you conducted um, your vulnerability assessment. So you can type that into the um, Q and A box here, and we can share it with the group. So with that general overview of um, conducting landscape genetics uh, research, I wanted to then provide a few case study examples of um, how this has been applied. So the first study here um, that I'm, I'm going to give as a case study focused on allelic richness of the stone lapping minnow, um, and that's the, this little fish shown here. And um, the researchers conducted this study in the Non River Basin in um, Thailand. The effects of site elevation, stream order, distance to main channel, and land use type were assessed um, based on the genetic diversity of the species. This map, um, shown here on the right, displays sampling locations along the river. The team also used multiple standard genetic diversity metrics. And what they found were that um, there were four um, specialized types or genetic clusters of species along different regions of the river. And the team found that the topography of the landscape really played a dominant role in the genetic variation of the species. Um, and then for all of these case study examples, um, the uh, paper is listed here as well. So you can reference that for more um, information about them. This next example focused on the genetic diversity of brook char, also a fish species shown here, um, within the La Maurice National Park um, in Canada. The team sampled 26 lakes with varying drainage systems and used multivariate analysis to assess landscape features and the correlation to the genetic diversity. So in this research, we found that the altitude of the lakes was a dominant factor in the diversity of the species, and that the size of the lake was not as large of a contributing factor. Um, again, uh, feel free to reference this paper um, at the link here for more information about this project. In this next example, um, invasive constrictor snakes were analyzed in the Everglades of South Florida. Giant constrictor snakes pose a threat to native species and to the ecological restoration of the Florida Everglades. And little is really known about the habitat and abundance of these species. eDNA methods were used to detect the presence of constrictors in the locations um, of, of the dots shown here on this map. Um, although the eDNA was heterogeneously distributed in the environment, 
um, the team used occupancy models to provide estimates of where they would expect to see um, these snake species. In this work, the Burmese python was detected in many of the locations. So you could see um, this picture of a really large python that was found um, in the area. And what the team found was that they, these uh, species of snakes were located along the northern edges of what managers uh, knew, uh, where they knew uh, the, the snakes were there. So the results will be really used to help these management agencies develop plans and, and um, help manage these snake species. While this is not a freshwater example, um, as I mentioned before, landscape genetics can be applied to many types of ecosystems, and including the marine environment. So I wanted to provide an example of another NASA-funded project focused on um, marine biodiversity and the, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. We mentioned some of these projects in a recent webinar um, focused on conservation. Um, and we hope to come back to some of these projects in future webinars as well. Um, but here, many groups use NASA data, such as MODIS and VIRS, to identify things like sea surface temperature, ocean color, bathymetry, along with genetic mar markers to um, help identify things like the help of the help kelp forest um, and biodiversity along the Florida Keys and the California coast. So while it's not fresh water, it's another um, example of marine water systems. Okay, and so the final example um, relates back to our Riverscape analysis focus. Um, in this example, Riverscape genetics modeling was used to assess whether climate and habitat variables were related to genetic differences in um, steelhead trout in the Columbia River Basin, and this is a threatened species there. Um, they found that wintertime precipitation was a dominant factor in genetic diversity, and further vulnerability assessments could indicate that increased precipitation under climate change may cause these populations to become more fragmented. Um, so this could help managers um, take action to prevent further fragmentation. So now in this last portion, I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview of the Riverscape Analysis Project and then do a, a short demonstration of the tools. So this uh, project was really formed under the uh, focus on salmonoids and how they are culturally and economically important in the Pacific Northwest and the North Pacific Rim. And these rivers are really critical habitat for spawning and juvenile salmon. And in some ways, these systems are poorly understood and uh, really have a lot of threats related to human development as well as climate change. So in order to identify conservation strategies, it's important to understand the dynamics of these species in, in the system. So RAP was created to create a classification of rivers and to map habitat quality and abundance of um, these species. RAP is being deployed um, into a web-based decision support system and um, has been created under NASA's Applied Sciences Division and is funded by many other entities as well. RAP offers a flexible, user-friendly, and scientifically robust data set, tools, and educational resources to really aid in the salmonoid conservation. Um, and there are many features of the RAP tool that include things like downloading remote sensing data, um, accessing habitat classification, and providing folks with the ability to conduct climate change vulnerability assessments and to integrate their own um, data in the region for um, understanding um, genetic analyses and demographic monitoring. So when you go to the main RAP page, you'll see multiple tabs. 
And um, there are three primary pieces of the project. Um, so there's salmon habitat, habitat, landscape genetics, and citizen science. The citizen science page um, provides folks with an overview of how to become engaged in the project. So the University of Montana and the Flathead Lake Biological Station are really focused on trout conservation. And um, if you're in this region and you would like to contribute to the project, you can go to this page and um, find more information on how to collect samples um, and how to measure fish length and to provide your information um, to the study. Um, and then on the, the website, you can also email um, one of the members of the RAP team to um, see how you can contribute. Okay, so now we're going to step through um, some of the features of the RAP tool and provide a short demonstration of what can be done within this tool. And I do want to mention that RAP focuses primarily on the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific North Rim region. So all the examples and the data and the types of analysis we'll show you today is specific to this region. However, it'd be great for you to all to think about how these similar data sets and features and types of analyses could be used in your region as well. So, you know, we've talked a lot about landscape genetics and how the uh, features of the research can be applied to multiple landscapes. So this is sort of another example of how this work has been done in the Pacific Northwest, but many of these tools and features could be attributed to your region. Um, so just keeping that in mind as we go through this demonstration. So the NPR Habitat and Climate Metric Extraction Tool allows users to download metrics like freeze, thaw, or fractional water for a user assigned sub-watershed within the North, North Pacific Rim. In the panel on the left, you can see different layers, and you can get a description of um, those data, um, such as the mean annual fractional water. Along the top, you can see three widgets, one for obtaining the watershed boundaries as a shapefile, another to obtain the freeze-thaw days, and the final one to obtain the mean annual fractional water percentage. So we can start by downloading the watershed information. You can do this by first clicking on the widget on the left called the Extract Subwatersheds. Then you'll see this little pop-up here. You can select a place on the map using the locator icon in the pop-up and then clicking on your region of interest within the map. You can also um, zoom in and turn on and off data layers. So we're going to zoom into a region near Eugene, Oregon, for this example. So here I've zoomed into this area and clicked on the map. Once the dot appears on the map, I can click on Extract. And it might take a few minutes to load, um, so that's why we've really um, just sort of used these screenshots within the tool. Um, so just be patient if you are going through these processes. And I also recommend using Google Chrome as your web browser, um, as I had some issues uh, using Firefox uh, with this tool as well. So um, after a minute or two, the outline of the watershed should appear, um, like that of the Fern Ridge Lake watershed, the outline that you see here. Um, there also will be a link to download the shapefile of this polygon, and you can see that here as well in the download data portion. And this will just provide you with the um, boundary of that uh, watershed that you could then um, take a look at in something like a, a GIS. So here you can also see some information about the uh, watershed of interest. 
So if we take a look at the freeze thaw widget, by clicking on the FT icon along the top, um, you'll stay zoomed into this region. And just by adding a point here, you can click on extract again when this little widget pops up. And again, this will take a few minutes. So be, please be patient as this process runs. But then you will also, um, once this process runs, you'll see um, a link up here where you can download the data as a CSV file. Um, this that you can also download the shape file uh, in the pop-up on the right. When you download the freeze thaw metric CSV file, you'll see a column for each year of the data. And um, in this case, here, you will see the, the column for each year of the data and in this case, it's 1979 to 2012. And you'll see the number of non-frozen days and saw days for that watershed. So um, this is derived from uh, global satellite information, uh, particularly from um, the scanning multi-channel microwave radiometer and special sensor microwaving imager, as well as AMSER E. So these uh, data here are generated via brightness temperature from these products. So you will also notice, um, right, going back here, you'll also notice along the top that um, there is the option to download um, metadata about the uh, information that you see here. Um, And you can um, obtain all of this and download it directly to your uh, computer. And then you can also run the same exact process for the fractional uh, water of the watershed of interest. So here, um, again, by clicking on the fractional water extraction um, icon or FW along the top, you will start to see the same thing. So you can gather the metrics on fractional water for this region as well. And again, um, you can download the data as a CSV. And here, what you'll see is um, a date. And this is provided in um, Julian Day. And then the percentage of open water within this watershed. And this data um, is also generated um, using AMSER E, as well as uh, some other data sets. And um, you can refer again to the metadata for um, information about this portion. So now that we have provided a little overview of the free saw and um, open water of the watersheds within the region, we'll, we'll now take a look at the climate extraction tool. So here you can obtain information about stream flow and temperature and the predicted changes to these variables under specific climate change scenarios. So this tool only has data available within um, the rivers from the North Pacific Rim. So um, it's really limited to this, this area, um, but the idea for it could be applied to different regions. To generate these data, um, a hydrological simulation scheme was developed to predict stream flow under temperature changes, under historical parameters, and then under uh, multiple climate change scenarios. So again, this relates back to the um, freshwater salmon habitat and the ability to understand how changes in the ecosystem might affect these species. So if you zoom into a stream of interest, such as the Willamette River here, again, um, zooming in towards Eugene, Oregon, you can see the option to download the data as a CSV uh, shown here, or um, providing uh, the discharge or temperature graph. You can click on more info next to these variables to learn a bit more about them. So if you do that, if you click on um, 
the more info next to the discharge or temperature graph, you will um, be taken to these figures shown here. Um, this figure is automatically generated that displays the historic average discharge for each day um, in blue, along with the estimated flow under multiple climate change scenarios. So you can do this for discharge, which is the figure shown on the left, or um, you can also obtain data for temperature, which is the figure shown on the right. And along the bottom, you can see which climate change scenarios are used um, and which color represents those um, scenarios. So you can see changes in these two parameters under these scenarios, and in particular, the increase in temperature in these regions. So the final tool I wanted to briefly highlight here is the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment Tool. And again, um, we're going to focus on the um, case study example from the RAP team. But if you have your own data um, for this region, you could also apply it and run your own um, climate change vulnerability assessment. So again, um, using this example from the RAP team, um, and this was the project that the tool was modeled after. It's this um, project focused on studying bull trouts to assess patterns of genetic diversity and how they're related to climatic variation and habitat features uh, within the Columbia River Basin. So this project um, compared allelic richness to four landscape parameters, total stream length, bathymetry, winter flood frequency, and maximum summer temperature. And they found that um, projected increases in stream temperatures and winter flooding are likely to adversely impact the ecological and evolutionary process of the bull trout, um, which is this threatened species. So you can see um, the, the paper shown here at the bottom for more information about this. So with this in mind, the uh, RAP team created a tool where um, you can add your own data via CSV and run some of these various metrics. So coming back to the tool here, uh, this is the initial interface when you click on the tool. And again, I really highly recommend that you um, read through all the information uh, about the metrics and the metadata if you want to add your own data into the tool. Um, again, for this example, I have just used the um, team's data that is available on the website for you. You can also run the same analysis for the bull trout. So if you click here um, along the download metric and metadata, that's where you're going to find a lot of this information. Let's start here with phase one. And by clicking on phase one, add data, uh, this pop-up will appear. And it takes you through the steps to perform the climate change vulnerability analysis or CCVA. Please first download the template that's shown here along the top. It's the first option to download. And this is the template where um, you could actually add your own data if you have data in the region, but it needs to follow this format. This is an example of what the template looks like. So for questions about what data to include and how to conduct these processes, um, please, again, refer back to that metadata link um, or contact the project team um, because I probably won't be able to answer your questions about um, the formatting or the types of data to be included here. Um, we're just going to kind of talk about the tool capabilities. Um, and for this example and for simplicity's sake, I um, am just adding this template back into the analysis to, to run it. Um, but if you have data in this region and, and want to uh, modify the template to include your own information on fish species or um, the location of your genetic sampling material, you can do so as well. So now um, 
if I save the CSV file of that example template to my computer, I can click on Browse, shown here, and then I can add the data into the map. So here I am just going to click on Browse and find my template file that I downloaded from the website. And then um, you now will see shown on the map here that there are these little red dots for each of the sampling locations that the team conducted for the bull trap example. If you click on one of these red dots, you'll see a pop-up of the information of the types of species, which BT is um, for bull trout, and then where the sampling location was taken, and then some of the genetic features as well. So here you can see that the genetic map layer that I added is this BTAR, which is that template for the bull trout information. Also notice that there's a short description in this pop-up about the um, climate change vulnerability assessment, and it takes into account three components of vulnerability. And the output is a relative ranking of the environment and climate variables that are coupled with the genetic material or demographic variables. I also encourage you to refer to the Way 2017 paper for any specifics on how this process was conducted. And that's um, listed here in the About section. So again, here are all of the locations where the team has collected bull trout information within this study region, indicated in red. And then what we can do is we're going to look at all of these different habitat variables, river density, dam density, um, and you can turn these on or off depending on um, the type of analysis you would like to run. And then um, including also the future climate variables. So then if you click here on the run CCVA, um, you can then wait for the results. After the process runs, what you'll see is a relative vulnerability ranking of each watershed that contains a bull trout sample. And then you can zoom into these specific locations to assess the, the vulnerability. Um, so if you were to add in your own data within this region, um, you would see your dot locations and then the analysis would run and we would assess the vulnerability of that um, particular species that you obtained your data about um, within the watershed of interest. So in this example, what we're going to zoom into some of the watersheds just north of Boise, Idaho, and take a look at them. If we zoom in here, you can see that um, these watersheds have varying levels of vulnerability based on those default metrics that are included in the model that we showed in a, a couple slides ago. So what this displays is in regards to bull trout, these are the watersheds that have a relative ranking of how vulnerable um, these species are within this watershed to climate change. And then you can also see by clicking on each of the individual watersheds, you can see what the output is. And you can get some information about the type of watershed and the name, as well as how the vulnerability ranking was assigned. You can also click on results here to see the relative ranking for each of the watersheds analyzed based on where your point locations are. So, that is just a really brief overview of the types of things that can be done with the Riverscape Analysis Project. And I really encourage you all to take a look at the tool, play around with the tool, um, and um, contact the, the RAP team for any further questions. Um, but this is an example of how landscape genetics and can be used to assess things like vulnerability. It can be used to assess how things might change under climate change. Um, and give you an idea of how these complex research projects can be completed. 
So just to summarize from today, landscape genetics is a really powerful tool for studying freshwater species especially with their vulnerability to um, changing climate conditions. You can also see that it's a pretty involved process. So uh, there are a lot of factors to consider when um, conducting these assessments for your region or species of interest. And eDNA is a really important component of conducting landscape genetics, especially in freshwater systems. Um, and then comparing those data to remote sensing data is really useful in terms of modeling the um, relative species abundance or the diversity of species and how that might change under changing climates. And the Riverscape Analysis Project provides information, opportunities for citizen science, and a few online tools for acquiring and analyzing freshwater habitat data in the Pacific Northwest. So again, I encourage you to take a look at that and think about how these types of um, features might be applicable to your region. So now we'll have a few minutes for questions. And I just wanted to also mention that you can follow up with myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez with any further questions. Or with our site related inquiries, you can um, email our program manager, Ann Pratas, at her email listed here. And we have a lot of other trainings, so take a look at the RSET website shown here um, for more information. And now we will go ahead and um, move on to the uh, question and answer session. But I do want to make everyone aware of our next session, our final session of this webinar series we'll focus on the freshwater health index and we'll we will be joined by a guest speaker from conservation international who was integral in creating the, the freshwater health index so um, thank you again and um, feel free to type your questions into the q a box uh, we're, we're now transitioning on to the q a document and um, also I wanted to point out that uh, some people are experiencing uh, problems getting to the tools for the RAP um, website. And I believe that with um, our large webinar participants here, um, they may just be experiencing an overload of users to that website. Um, so if you're interested in those tools, please do come back to them at a later date um, and investigate them. Um, also, we've had quite a few participants mention other tools available um, that are similar to RAP, and we'll discuss those um, here as we go through the questions as well. Um, so do please add um, other questions that you may have to the Q&A, and if we don't get to them, um, feel free to follow up um, with myself or my colleague about them. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with our first question. Um, and this is a really good question. Uh, it states, can eDNA be used to identify plant species in aquatic environments? And um, the short answer is maybe. <laughs> um, it's a bit more difficult to identify plant species as there are few universal plant DNA markers um, that can be applied across a, a wide number of species. And, effectively allow the eDNA samples to distinguish between different plant species. Um, but there are researchers out there who are working on this. Um, there's a research team in Canada who are interested in identifying um, what they call pond weeds, I believe, and using eDNA markers to identify those. So we've provided the link to, to that for, for you all um, who, are, who may be interested. And then, I also did want to mention that um, we discussed this last week, but there are other variables um, outside of the eDNA markers that can be used to identify um, things like harmful algal blooms, um, such as the use of chlorophyll A, um, or um, different pigments associated with um, certain cyanobacterial uh, species and um, can be used as an indicator for um, these types of blooms. So do please refer to those references that we provided 
um, during the last Q&A session, we had a lot of uh, references provided on those types of analyses. So please do um, refer to that. Um, okay, the next question refers to part of the demonstration from the RAP tool. Um, I may have missed this information, but what do the dots represent? And um, the dot represented the, the point on the map where we are pulling information from that specific watershed. So all I did was click on the map and the point was generated and then you could see the outline or the shape file of that watershed and that's the watershed where um, we were downloading the data from. Um, and that was, I am assuming that's from the freeze thaw uh, demo because that's about when the question was posted. Um, Right, so that, that was a simple um, answer for, for that one. So the next question, also referring to the demo, can you download more than one pixel? Um, and I believe, uh, as far as I understand it, you can only um, download data from one watershed at a time for the freeze thaw tool and the climate extraction tool. Um, However, for the final tool, the CCVA that we mentioned, um, I, I did discuss how you could add your own points if you have data from that region and um, want to analyze the vulnerability of um, certain watersheds for your specific species. You can um, upload multiple points. And I gave the example of the uh, multiple points for bull trout from the RAP team there. Uh, the next question. Um, so there were uh, quite a few questions along this, these lines. Um, it states, I'm not aware of anything like this for Africa. Um, and I am not aware of anything like this for Africa either. Um, but some of you may be working in this region or other regions and, and may be more familiar um, with those studies. So do please provide um, links to any of those types of tools that you are aware of. Um, we have had a couple participants provide a few other examples. There's another similar tool from the Pacific Northwest region, um, and we've provided the link for this here. Um, and then uh, there, there is another one from the Chesapeake Bay Area, and we've provided um, the link to that as well. Um, we also have provided a uh, a review of uh, water quality for freshwater systems that includes African systems. And there's a link to that paper as well um, shown here on um, the question document. Um, and we, as with the other uh, webinars, will post that this document online after um, we uh, sort of gather all the questions here. So you'll have those references to um, use at a later date. Okay, so um, this next question um, refers to the tool not working, and I did mention that um, it looks like uh, the tools were experiencing a lot of traffic. So um, please do come back to that at a later date. Um, and the next question, question six, is, is similar to um, question four. Um, so I'm not aware of any other tools. Um, and um, I uh, may not have the, the information as I um, don't really work in these types of systems. So please, if anyone else has idea, um, examples of um, other tools for uh, different regions, East Africa, Asia, please do share them. Um, this tool is specific to the Pacific Northwest and Pacific Rim region. Um, the next question, question seven, um, what is the benefit of using RAP tool instead of a GIS? Um, so I believe that the benefit here is that you can run um, these analyses and um, generate graphs and conduct the climate change vulnerability assessment all within the web tool where you're not having to um, necessarily download your own data um, 
if you were to conduct this in a GIS, it would be entirely possible. Um, you would just need to go through a lot of these same steps, and um, sometimes it can be a little bit more clunky to to do to do it that way. Um, it really is preference, and also I think that um, if you are downloading your own data, um, such as Landsat data, to create a um, land cover a map, um, you are you do have this. Um, real close connection to the data and you're able to um, understand it really well. So there's the benefit of using QGIS and, and having all of your own data and going through those processes. Um, but I think the benefit of tools like this is just that online component, that on the fly computing, um, the ability to run these analyses without having to go through a lot of complicated steps and that can take a lot of time. Um, so, and use a lot of space on your computer. Um, the, the next question, question eight, um, and I think this might be our last one as we are right about time, and I think the questions have been slowing down a bit. Um, the question is, can the RAP tool be used to identify species in a watershed? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, the RAP tool can ingest your own data of um, about species in the region if you are interested in conducting something like the climate um, change vulnerability assessment, but I don't believe um, that they have a, a library of uh, DNA markers or species markers for this region within the tool itself. Um, so I would please refer to the website for um, clarification on that, but I don't believe that the tool is designed to identify many species in the region. I think it's really focused on salmonoids um, as, as that was sort of the outline of the project scope. Okay, I'll do one more question. <laughs> I just saw one more on here. Um, and it kind of refers back to uh, this question about the benefit of, of um, QGIS. Can we develop a global tool such as RAP? Um, I believe that, you know, it would take a lot of time, uh, um, but it certainly is possible, right? So this provides an example of what can be done for a specific region, um, but it outlines sort of the data needs and um, the information that would need to be pulled into a global tool like this. I think creating a global tool would take a lot of effort, would require input from many scientists around the globe, um, and, but it could be done. You know, there are global tools for identifying um, land cover or uh, identifying river systems. Um, so I, I, th I do think it is possible, um, but I, I do believe you would need um, a nice research team that has uh, the experience and the ability to um, do these types of analyses on a really large scale. Um, okay, great. Well, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, please do join us for our final um, webinar next week. Um, we will have a um, guest speaker from Conservation International that we're really excited about. So um, we'll be focusing on freshwater health, um, the freshwater health index. So it's another really um, fantastic tool um, that you could use for um, assessing freshwater health uh, in many regions around the world. And it's more of a global tool. So um, please do stay tuned for that. Also, uh, just a reminder, you can download the um, presentation slides here on the RSET website, and we will have the Q&A transcript for session two up there. And the, the, session, the transcript from session one is currently available, so you can access that for all those references that we discussed and all those questions we answered last week. So thanks again, and we will see you in a week. <laughs>